Stopp. Weiter. Zurück die Polizei. Am Anfang. Und immer noch SA. Wir sagen, wie lange das dauert, wie lange das die SA hier markieren. Mehrere Stunden dauern. Das können wir natürlich für 50, über 15.000 SA-Leute die markieren. Und was schätzen Sie von Stahlhelm? Von Stahlhelm? Das würde ich besser sagen können, wenn ich nicht mehr da sitze und da markieren werde. Ich kann von hier aus, kann ich aber auch sagen, wie sein. Wir 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 Aufbruch, denn diese ganze Zeit, das hat sich ja doch erst in der Innerhalb von zwei oder drei Stunden entwickelt. The 30th of January, 1934. A torchlit parade of Sturmabteilung und Stahlhelm have marched through the Brandenburger Tor. 15,000 men, decked in brown shirts, burning torches in their hands, a procession that snakes and weaves. Goebbels will claim ten times the number, but the truth was, more had lined the streets when the Stresemann had made his final journey three years prior. Then the Berliners had not only mourned a great diplomat, but also had mourned the death of peace and hope. Now the crooked cross of the swastika emblazoned in black upon the blood-red band flashed before the curious as the march toward death and destruction began. A short distance away, a crowd was gathering on the Wilhelmplatz. Pushing and shoving the supporters of the new Reich's chancellor an Austrian who had served in the Bavarian army and naturalized as a German in the free state of Brunswick, moved to get closer to the new wing of Bismarck's old chancery. On that morning, Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's spin chief, had written the words in his diary, Is the big hour really here? I don't dare believe it yet. The hour was upon Germany. The crowds at the window made it clear. Berlin, the great red fortress, home to Reichsregierung, a government that was fractured and bickering, had fallen. Now, in this hour, when to this point, the politics of the Western world had failed to heed words of warning, the tide was with Hitler. For months he had paced the rooms and corridors of the great Kaiserhof Hotel, looking from its grandiose neoclassical windows across the Wilhelmplatz toward the Bismarck Chancery, to which he wished to occupy. Now, now the time had come. Through debate and deliberation, coercion and compromise, those around President Paul von Hindenburg persuaded the aged Feldmarschall who had thrust the dagger into the back of the Kaiser to commit another treason. A treason of conscience, treason against humanity, and a treason against Germany and her peoples that few had wished to see. Sir Horace Rumbold, British ambassador to Germany 1928 to 1933, had prophesied, It would be misleading to base any hopes on a return to sanity. The German government is encouraging an attitude of mind, which can only end in one way. I have the impression that the persons directing the policy of the Hitler government are not normal. So, on the morning of the 30th of January 1933, at half past 11, the debates came to an end. Hitler would be made Reich's Chancellor. However, He was to be Reich's chancellor over a cabinet dominated by the, only slightly, more moderate conservatives of Franz von Papen, whom had seized power over Prussia the previous year. Richard J. Evans writes, The government of which he, Hitler, was to head was dominated numerically by Papen and his fellow conservatives. The radical wing of the much shrunken Nationalist Party entered the government with Alfred Hugenberg taking over the Economics Ministry and the Ministry of Food. Konstantin Freiherr von Neurath, already foreign minister in the Papen and Schleicher governments, continued in office, as did Lutz Graf Schwerin von Krosig in the Finance Ministry, and, a little later, Franz Gertner for the Nationalists in the Ministry of Justice. The Army Ministry was taken over by Werner von Blomberg, Franz Selter, representing the steel helmets, moved 
into the Ministry of Labour. Wir sind nun herübergegangen aus dem Zimmer, in dem wir den Herrn Reichspräsidenten sehen konnten, in das Zimmer, in dem sich der neue Reichskanzler Adolf Hitler befindet. Wir stehen am offenen Fenster. Sie können jetzt besonders gut hören, wie die Menge jubelt. Wir lassen Ihnen noch einen Augenblick die Musik von draußen ins Fenster hereinschallen. For those crowds that evening, the curious, the blind, the supporters, the objectors, may have seen triumph in Hitler's appointment, dismay, or the appeasement that had brought him to power. But it was with that appeasement that, within few, realized the danger that now loomed over them. Hitler had been granted just two seats, two officers in the cabinet. For some supporters, this may have been belittling or even a defeat. But for Hitler and the Nationalsozialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, or NSDAP, the small offering was a great triumph. For the two officers granted were key positions that would aid in the facilitation of the path Hitler had prescribed ahead. One was to be occupied by Wilhelm Frick, that of the office of the Minister of the Interior the second of the Reich Chancellery itself. And then finally came another seat. It was a seat without office itself, but the seat belonged now to Hermann Goering, and he was now, as Reich Minister without portfolio and as acting Prussian Minister of the Interior, had direct control over the police in Germany. With the office of Minister of the Interior responsible for law in Germany, and with Hermann Goering as chief of the police across Germany, Hitler and the NSDAP had the ability to create and enforce law. There could be, as Richard Evans writes, a manipulation of the whole of domestic law and order situation to Hitler's advantage. Yet von Papen, Hugenberg and Hindenburg, whom believed at this moment they had tamed the vulgar tide of Hitler and his brown shirts, had not realized the underestimation they had appraised Hitler with. Hitler, who came to the Reich's chancellery window that evening to the cheers of the crowd below. Goebbels wrote, The time has come. We are sitting in the Wilhelmstrasse. Hitler is Chancellor of the Reich. Like in a fairy tale, now we have to win him over completely. We all have tears in our eyes. Reichstag is dissolved, new elections in four weeks, the first stage, our fighting. Hugenberg, Papen, Vice-Chancellor. These blemishes must be erased. Waiting for the torchlight procession. The torches are coming. It starts at 7 p.m. endlessly until 10 p.m. endless. A million people on the way. The old man takes the march past. Hitler in the next building. Departure, spontaneous explosion of the people, indescribable, always new masses. Hitler is gone. His people are cheering him, speaking on the radio, over all German stations. Hail to Hindenburg and Hitler. Wild frenzy of enthusiasm reflected with Hitler. Today Reichstag to be dissolved, tomorrow proclamation to the people, Prepare election campaign, the last one. We're going to win by a landslide. The blemishes must be erased. Those whom had appointed Hitler had not listened. There was no quenching his thirst for power, and those within the government whom opposed the new chancellor were to be literally smoked out. Smoked out when the Reichstag caught fire. Achtung! Achtung, hier ist die Sendestelle Berlin im Voxhaus. Meine Damen und Herren, Welcome to Arctum History, a weekly podcast written and presented by myself, Simon J. James. This week, Reichstag, fanning the flames.
much of the city was asleep. A Monday night in Berlin was a night when even those whom had tested the stretch of alertness to its limit had snapped and fallen like normality toward a slumber. The clock on the sideboard was steadily ticking, the minute hand approaching the top of the hour as the smaller hour hand continued upon its glide. The staccato movement of the gears so slight as to being imperceptible to the naked eye toward the hour of nine. In the dark hours of the night, it was almost forgivable to wake from the nightmare of the day and fall into the illusional dreams that the dark provided as they blanketed reality in shadow, that all might remain normal. Yet all was not normal. Just two days after Hitler had come from Kaiserhof to Reich's Chancellery, the Reichstag was dissolved due to a failure to progress further with the negotiations to form a government, with the centralists led by the Roman Catholic priest Ludwig Kass. The date set for the new election for the Reichstag was to be the 5th of March. Three days after the president's decree for new elections, further laws were passed. These new laws, passed on the 4th of February, diminished the security that was afforded man by law within the Constitution. It was titled, Verordnung des Reichspräsidenten zum Schutze des Deutschen Volkes, or Decree of the Reichspräsident for the Protection of the German People. Yet despite the name, it was to do quite the opposite. The law was the first that was to legitimize the NSDAP pursuit of power. In a Prussia that was, despite Hitler becoming Chancellor, still dictated over by Franz von Papen since the Preußenschlag that I will cover in a future episode, that had removed the democratically appointed government by Hindenburg's presidential decree, the new law read as such. Decree implementing the decree of the President of the Reich for the protection of the German people of February the 4th, 1933. Responsible are, paragraph one, for the prohibition of public political assemblies and of open air assemblies and processions and for the approval of such events subject to conditions in lieu of prohibition under paragraph one of the ordinance. In urban districts and in localities with state police administration, the local police authorities, otherwise the district councils. If the prohibition relates to an assembly that has already begun, the police's authorities delegated representatives are authorized to prohibit the continuation of the assembly. Two, for ordering the police seizure and confiscation of printed matter pursuant to subsection 17, paragraph two of the ordinance, in addition to the local police authorities, also the district councils and the chief of police in Berlin. The territorial effect of the order shall extend to the area of the ordering authority. If the seizure and confiscation is ordered by the police president in Berlin, the effect shall extend to the entire national territory. Three, for the prohibition of periodical printed matter in accordance with subsection 9, 10, and 11 of the ordinance, also the chief presidents for the area of their province, the district president in Sigmaringen for the area in the district of Sigmaringen, and the police chief in Berlin for the districts of the city of Berlin. Four, for the prohibition of the collection of donations in money or in any kind, according to subsection 14, paragraph 1 of the ordinance, also the district presidents for the area of their district and the chief of police in Berlin for the district of the city of Berlin. 5. For the ordering and enforcement of local police measures pursuant to subsection 22 of the ordinance, the local police authorities. As ever, the NSDAP's intent was carefully calculated and the timing considered. The decree for the new vote, the Neuerwahl of the Reichstag, having been decreed on the first, meant that the parties were very much having to scramble with haste toward the infrastructure required to lead new election campaigns. Yet the limitations that were passed by law just three days later meant that all public assemblies were banned. The printing of election materials, i.e. posters and placards, could not take place if those in question fell foul of the police president in Berlin. In essence, the law, signed in Prussia by dictator Franz von Papen and minister without portfolio Goering, was not the protection of the German people, but rather their enslavement. 
Limiting the freedoms of the German people, these laws naturally were targeted towards the opposition. And even now, the bickering and fractured parties of the Social Democrats and the Communists could not find common ground to mount a counterattack. There was no movement toward a general strike like that that had crippled the Kap Lutwitz Putsch almost exactly 13 years prior. On the 7th of February, the opposition party, the Social Democrats, opened their stunted campaign. The Communist Party met in secret, as they were already facing persecution to launch their own. On the same day in Berlin, on the Lustgartens, in the shadow of the magnificent Berliner Dom, over 200,000 people gathered to protest the new laws in what would become amongst the last large gatherings of people standing in protest to the National Socialists. On the 10th, however, Hitler launched the NSDAP's campaign with a fiery speech in the Berlin Sports Palast. On January 30th, we took over government. Devastating conditions have descended upon our folk. It is our desire to remedy them, and we will succeed in doing so. Just as we eliminated these adversaries, despite all the scorn, we shall also eliminate the consequences of their rule. To do justice to God and our own conscience, we have turned once more to the German folk. It shall now play a helping role. It will not deter us should the German folk abandon us in this hour. We will adhere to whatever is necessary to keep Germany from degenerating. However, it is our wish that this age of restoration of the German nation be associated not only within a few names, but with the names of the German folk itself. That the government not be working alone but that a mass of millions come standing behind this government, that the government have the will, with the aid of this backing, to fortify us once again for this great and difficult task. I know that, were the graves to open today, the ghosts of the past who once fought and died for Germany would float aloft, and our place today would be behind them. All the great men of our history, of this I am certain, are behind us today and watch over our work and our labors. For 14 years, the parties of disintegration of the November Revolution have seduced and abused the German folk. For 14 years, they have wreaked destruction, infiltration, and dissolution. Considering this, it is not presumptuous of me to stand before the nation today and plead of it. German folk, Give us four years' time, and then pass judgment upon us. German folk, give us four years, and I swear to you, just as we, just as I have taken this office, so shall I leave it. I have done it neither for salary nor for wages. I have done it for your sake. It has been the most difficult decision of my life. I dare to make it because I believe that it had to be. I have dared to make this decision because I am certain that one cannot afford to hesitate any longer. I have dared to make this decision because it is my conviction that our folk will finally return to its senses and that, even if millions might curse us today, the hour will come in which they will march with us after all, having recognized that we really wanted nothing but the best and had no other goal in sight than serving what is, to us, most precious on earth. Hitler ended quite strangely. He stood at the lectern and quoted the Protestant version of the Lord's Prayer. However, he did so with some changes. For I cannot divest myself of my faith in my folk, cannot disassociate myself from the conviction that this nation will one day rise again, cannot divorce myself from my love for this, my folk, and I cherish the firm conviction that the hour will come at last in which the millions who despise us today will stand by us and with us will hail the new, hard-won and painfully acquired German Reich we have created together. The new German kingdom of greatness and power and glory and justice. Amen. Hitler, however, was not asking for the four years. He was demanding... The German people already had no choice.
but they also did not quite realize it yet. The law for the protection of the German people had been carefully worded to give power toward the Berlin police president, an office that had been held until 1932 and the Preussenschlag by Albert Grzynski. Grzynski, an SPD politician, had had the foresight to issue a gag order on Hitler in 1931 and have him deported, but alas the centre party failed Germany when its leader Heinrich Brüning and then Chancellor not signing it. But with the Preußenschlag, the police president of Berlin had passed to Kurt Melcher of Stresemann's own Deutsche Volkspartei. Melcher, however, was just an intermediary. Appointed at a time when the NSDAP did not have the power that it now had commandeered. Therefore, on the 15th of February, Melcher was also to make way. In Melcher's stead was placed Magnus von Levetzel. Von Levetzel, an admiral of the Great War, had been a supporter of the right-wing push in 1920 of Kap Lutwitz, and even had continued the push calling for the arrest of the then Reich's president Ebert after Kap had withdrawn from the push that held his name. Von Levitzow, an ardent monarchist, had strived to return former monarch Kaiser Wilhelm II to power throughout the 1920s. But as von Levitzow grew closer to the NSDAP, even the former Kaiser cast him from his circle at the end of 1932. But now, with a member of the NSDAP as head of the Berlin police, the pieces were being drawn into a direct line of power. There was rapidly becoming no one to stand in the way of the whims of Hitler and Goering. For the opposition parties, they were now faced with a choice, protest, picket, campaign and fight against tyranny, but no in doing so, Goering and Levetzo could, under the new laws, imprison anyone who fell foul of the laws for three months without trial, under paragraph six. Three months, that means they would miss the election. To add to the influence of the NSDAP into the Prussian police on the ground, i.e. to the police who walked the streets, and after a request from SS Gruppenführer Kurt Dalloweger to cleanse the police of unreliable elements, Goering and von Levetzow, just two days after the latter's appointment set about, mobilizing elements of the SS, SA and Stahlhelm into the police as Hilfspolizei, or special police. In total, 25,000 SA men, 15,000 SS members, and 10,000 Stahlhelm members were mobilized officially on the 22nd of February in such a way. These new Hilfspolizei were also given an order. The activities of organizations hostile to the state are to be countered with the harshest means. Police officers who make use of firearms in the performance of these duties will be covered by me regardless of the consequences of the use of firearms. On the other hand, those who fail in false consideration will face penal consequences under the law of the service. It was a firing order. Suppress the opposition with utmost brutality. Murder those who stand in the way, for if you don't, you yourself will be punished. There was little opposition within the police to this new order. Whilst actions of the Prussian police in the 1920s hadn't been perfect by any means, they had, through the 20s, been dominated by Social Democrats. The Social Democrats, who themselves had been the principal supported party since the Reichstag elections of 1890 in the form of the Socialistische Arbeiterpartei Deutschlands. In the 1920s, the Prussian police had been a model for the world in new courses of investigation and forensic. Names like Ernst Gennat were known the world over, and the techniques of the Prussian police became standard practice. Above Ernst Gennat, though, was Bernard Weiss. Weiss was the stalwart of democracy, and chiefly the Republic. Under his eye as vice president of the Berlin police, a position granted him in 1927, he crafted a police that was to be a defender of the Republic. With a new model of the policeman crafted in the image of the commander of the Berlin Schutzpolizei, Magnus Heimansberg, the police was to be a defender of democracy and intervene in protests and riots that aimed to disrupt the rule of law. 
But Bernhard Weiss was also a Jew, and therefore quickly became the enemy of the NSDAP. Goebbels targeted Weiss in the newspaper De Angriff and named him Isidore. Weiss fought back, but through the courts, suing the future propaganda minister numerous times. But increasingly, as the power of the NSDAP grew, the sentences passed on to Goebbels grew weaker and weaker. However, what Weiss, Heimensberg, Prussian Interior Minister Severing and others had done was create a moderate police force. Yet when Hindenburg granted von Papen domain over Prussia in 1932, Weiss was arrested, as was Heimensberg and Severing, who had the loyalty of the police force to quash the Reich's government's putsch on Prussia, erred towards moderation and failed to instigate a rebellion against an unjust movement. With this move, the Prussian House was cleansed of the key social democrats and democrats at its head, and all that remained was for the new powers to dilute the republican sentiments within its structure with the extremists of their own. That was the purpose of this new mobilization, curtail the powers of any remnant groups of republicans within the police structure by overpowering them with the soldiers of the NSDAP. From the instigation of this new mobilization, the members of the Social Democrats, as well as the Communists, were being harassed. Whilst the Social Democrats may have continually suffered through the Weimar Republic as support drifted either to extremes or to parties who memorialized the past systems of monarchy and wished for its return, the Communists, on the other hand, had seen a slow increase in support. The infamous riots of May 1929, which the then Berlin police President Karl Zorgebiel had infamously brutally suppressed in what became known as Blood Mai, had not decreased the support for the Communist Party. Rather, it had found it new sympathies, rising from 10.6% of the Reichstag in 1928 to 143 in the elections of July 1932 and 16.9% in November, an increase made at the expense of the NSDAP. Yet the persecution that the Communist Party had felt under the Social Democratic-led government was now being felt by the Social Democrats themselves. With the new laws, the papers of the Social Democrats, such as Forvarts, were banned. The Social Democrats, rather than break with the law and continue publication, fought the bans in court and often won. But meanwhile, the SA continued to harass the Social Democratic gatherings, with former police chief Albert Krasinski stating, Several of my meetings have been broken up and a substantial number of those present had to be taken away with serious injuries. So how did the Social Democrats react? They didn't. Goebbels on the 15th of February noted of the plans that were to be put in place. One chief president after the other is toppled. Names that meant the world yesterday fade into insignificant shadows today. Admiral Levitso is appointed chief of police in Berlin. Lutzer becomes police chief in Hanover and Schepfmann in Dortmund. They put up with it. We are gradually becoming entrenched in the administration. One thing follows another. The pace of the revolution must be rushed, otherwise we could end up losing the reins. Now we also have a new weapon against the press. And now the bands are banging so hard that it's just like that. Vorwarts and Acht Abendblatt, all those Jewish organs that have caused us so much trouble and grief, disappear from the Berlin streetscape in one fell swoop. This is soothing and has a beneficial effect on the soul. Rather than continuing, the Social Democrats rolled over. Meetings were cancelled in order to avoid any further casualties, as now, in the eyes of those who governed, the Social Democrats were seen as a party that was hostile to the state. Therefore, suppression of a Social Democratic meeting could be made by the use of firearms with, under the declaration to the Hilfspolizei of the 22nd of February, impunity. The NSDAP had, in less than a month, created a system where resistance by the fractured opposition to the NSDAP was not only futile, but suicidal. Richard Evans writes, Had an uprising been attempted, 
it would doubtless have met the same fate as the workers' uprising staged in Vienna a year later against the coup d'etat that established the clerico-fascist dictatorship of Engelbert Dollfuss, in which the well-equipped and well-armed socialists were crushed by the Austrian army within a few days. The last thing the German social democratic leadership wanted to do was to shed the workers' blood, least of all in collaboration with the communists, who they rightly thought would ruthlessly exploit any violent situation to their own advantage. Throughout the early months of 1933, therefore, they stuck rigidly to a legalistic approach and avoided anything that might provoke the Nazis into even more violent action against them. But why, once in power, did the NSDAP feel the need to persecute and undermine the opposition? Hitler, since his failed putsch in Bavaria in 1923, had taken an attitude that would power would be gained by an exploitation of the system in place. There was not the place for a violent revolution like that he had tried with support from Hindenburg's attack dog Ludendorff, an attack that bore the name of where it began, the Beerhall Putsch. Rather, Hitler had used traditional and legal means to rise to his appointment as Chancellor on the 30th of January. So why now? When the momentum was with the NSDAP, was it necessary to vanquish the parties he had beaten to become Chancellor? The matter of fact was that the momentum was not with the NSDAP any longer. The NSDAP had risen in support due, often to the bickering and fragmentation of its political enemies. It had managed to capitalize on the theory of the November traitors, the idea that the politicians of the Weimar Republic had instigated Germany's defeat in World War I, to which many within Germany felt that Germany had not been defeated. It, Germany, had ended the war in a position where its troops were far from Germany's borders. And therefore, in this mindset, it could have only been the politicians at home who had facilitated Germany's defeat, and therefore allowed for the hated Treaty of Versailles that had belittled Germany and place sole blame upon her, and chiefly her peoples, for the horrors of the war that had lasted four years and claimed millions of lives. This, the young plan that sought to ease some of the national suffering caused by the Treaty of Versailles, and the following Wall Street crash, a great failure of capitalism, which had driven Germany into a great period of despair, had seen the support ebb from the more traditional parties that were seen to be complicit in Germany's suffering, and towards those who had rejected the Treaty of Versailles and capitalism, namely the extremes. So through the period of Germany's suffering that began not 23 days before the fateful crash when the Trauerzug, the mourning parade for Gustav Stresemann, had passed through the columns of the Brandenburger Tor, the NSDAP had capitalized on the failures of the government and exploited the emotions and sentiments of the people. They, the NSDAP, had grown from 2.6% in 1928 to 18.3% in 1930 and reached a zenith of 37.3% in July 1932, before falling to the 33.1% in November of that same year. In half a year, the NSDAP had lost over 4% of its support that took it from a dominant force to just holding a lead ahead of the parties that, if they could work together, might have been able to push the NSDAP aside. What ho, Simon here. Sorry for the interruption. This isn't the end of the episode, but a quick interjection to ask if you are enjoying the Arctic History podcast, that you consider leaving a rating, and if you can, become a Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Arctic History to help support the continuation of this podcast. Remember that every penny raised through Patreon is reinvested into the podcast. Now, back to the episode. Support had fallen for a few reasons. Many of the middle class voters had supported the NSDAP, had left after the NSDAP had joined sides with the communists briefly in a transport strike in Berlin of the Beifall Gay that was held three days before the election which had ostracized the middle class members. Equally, these supporters were disturbed when in September, Göring as Reichstag president had overlooked Chancellor von Papen in the parliament. Von Papen had entered the plenary hall 
with a decree to dissolve the parliament in response to the NSDAP and communists joining together once again in a vote to strip von Papen of the emergency ordinances with which he had used to rule. Moderates found the increasingly brutal tactics of the SA in the street battles abhorrent and had turned away, and the stabilizing economic situation had meant that the trials of the German people on which Hitler and his cohorts had exploited were coming to an end as some modicum of normality in economic society was returning, thus meaning an exodus of the small and medium-sized business owners' support. With the drop in support of the NSDAP in the November elections, Joseph Goebbels turned once more to his diary. Each new report brings a new defeat. As a result, we have lost 34 mandates. The centre also suffered some losses. The German nationalists gained a little, and the Social Democrats lost a little. Voter turnout decreased. The KPD, the Communists, made strong gains. This was to be expected. A government of reaction is always the pacemaker of Bolshevism. We have suffered a defeat. The reasons? The masses have not yet advanced far enough, and the unscrupulous exploitation of our contacts with the centre by the German national propaganda. Neither of these circumstances is our own fault. We therefore need not reproach ourselves. We are now facing difficult and sacrificial struggles. The main thing is to hold the party. The organization must be strengthened and the mood must be raised. A number of errors and shortcomings that have crept in require correction. It must not be overlooked that the government has the support of barely 10% of the people. Therefore, it cannot hold on. Some kind of change must occur. I set out our position in an essay entitled Chancellor Without the People. It speaks out very sharply against the government. I am immediately at hand with this so that the depressive mood in the party does not take on too great an extent. It is admirable how strong and high-spirited the entire leadership of the party is. There is no question of the slackness and fluffiness. We have survived other crises, and we will cope with this one as well. As a result of the election defeat, the prospects for a victorious outcome of the Bayfow gay strike have, of course, been greatly diminished. The SPD has betrayed them. As the cat does not let go of the mouse, so Marxism does not let go of the stab in the back. Although the red bigwigs are triumphant today, they will probably soon stop laughing. What is unpopular today will be popular tomorrow. We must only remain firm and steadfast, not give in, and insist on our right. The boisterous vocabulary of returning to form on the day of the first NSDAP defeat on its ascent to power was just two days later replaced by pessimism. A lousy atmosphere at the Gao. I raise Kreisleiter, SAF, and Beifau gay people to blow again everything ready. Hitler's call, fight on, Papen must go, but we will slave away. Editorial course given. It will be all right. Bayfowl gay strike subsides. Hopeless. Jump off. Still working at home. Held off comes to report. Essay in good shape. And much trouble, worry, and drudgery. In the evening, in the gal, press studied. Everywhere, our defeat. No self-delusion. The tide was turning against the NSDAP. And Hitler's appointment to Chancellor was fortuitous as the ebbing of the flow of support was rescinding from their favour. Therefore, it was a necessity that Goering and Frick receive the posts appointed them to implement the moves that would starve the Republic of the Tools to suppress the NSDAP. With the new election scheduled for the 5th of March, called after Hitler's coming to power, Goebbels made it evident the position that the NSDAP in Berlin was in regards to financing a political campaign when he wrote in his diary on the 14th of February. Niemann has done stupid things with money. We'll try to keep him still. Conferences, most important, of the Reich's propaganda ministry. Only the money is missing. Berlin cash register in order, Goering cleans up, will be created. But also bread? Trouble with election agitators. Everywhere Frick and Goering under our noses. Hit the calls a few times, I stay, at home. We continue to slave away. 
Hanker announces that no money can be expected for election campaigns. Then fat Goering should do without some caviar for once. Nausea. A day later, however, the problem was solved two ways. First of all, with the purging of the remnants of the Social Democrats from the police, bringing the policing of the laws passed by the Interior Ministry of Frick under the control of the NSDAP, and with Goebbels' publisher advancing a huge sum of money. Now the opposition couldn't advertise themselves for fear of reprisals, and the NSDAP had the funds to continue their propaganda. Hitler, on the 22nd of February, knowing the communists had been enjoying success from the NSDAP defeat, now lashed out at who he saw as the principal enemy of the NSDAP in coming elections, the communists. Provocative elements are attempting, under the guise of the party, to discredit the National Socialist movement by disrupting and breaking up centre party assemblies in particular. I expect all National Socialists to distance themselves from these designs with the utmost discipline. The enemy who must be felled on March the 5th is Marxism. Hitler was baiting the communists. He wished for a reaction. If they, the Communist Party, the KPD, reacted, they were sure to find out how extremely Goering and Levetzo could interpret the laws for the protection of the German people and how far they were willing to take liberties in the punishments dealt. Yet the KPD and its Rotter Front, its reactionary arm, sat still. They would not be baited. On the evening of Hitler's proclamation that Marxism was the enemy, SA and SS wandered the streets of Berlin, now not as an organ of a party, but rather as officials as proclaimed by Goering's decree. They caused horror and chaos, and still the communists would not be baited. The following day, infuriated that the communists were not reacting, therefore not subjugating themselves to the effects of the laws, the SS and SA stormed the Karl Liebknecht House on the then Bülow Platz in Berlin, today's Rosa Luxemburg Platz. Even the proclamation that the SA and SS had found plans to instigate a revolution within the Karl Liebknecht House did not bait the communists. The plans of the NSDAP to eliminate the KPD with the new decrees failed again. It wasn't the ticking of the clock that caught his attention. No. The ticking from the movement of the clock had become imperceptible to the ear after so many years of its monotonous, mechanical continuation. Rather, it was a different rhythm that interrupted the monotony. Another musical sound. It was the ringing of the bell of the telephone. Two seconds on, two seconds off, two seconds on. In normal times, the chiming of the bell would have been an intrusion on a Monday evening. On a day, even the papers only would have printed a singular issue. Yet times were not normal. The Monday papers had been reduced further since the laws decreed at the beginning of the month, but the telephone had increased its nightly ringing further as warnings of action by the forces of the NSDAP, which had now become the forces of the government, had become more extreme and more prolific. Wearily, Johannes picked up the receiver from the cradle in which it lay within the study of his apartment. There was a female voice on the other end of the line. Adlon Hotel speaking, we have a call for you. There came a momentary click as the line was switched to whomever had placed the call from within the Grand Hotel on Parisa Platz, in sight of the Brandenburger Tour. Suddenly a male voice, deep and hearty, spoke with haste. That you, Johannes? Where's your car? It was a voice that Johannes knew, and a voice one wouldn't forget. It, the voice, was confusing in its accent, varying between a German form of English and then toward an English form of German. It was as confusing as it could be in betraying the owner's nationality. But it did betray the owner. The man who spoke was a large man, larger than life in many ways, whom often took residence in the acclaimed hotel. He was a man who lounged around the lobby and bar area, and even in his lounging commanded an aura of power that caused those looking toward him to drop their gaze quickly and turn away. 
He was a man who, on sitting down, would place before him a fine pocket watch, crafted from gold by the finest of watchmakers, perhaps his father. A watch that he would casually discard on the table before him, a signal of his power, as nobody, not the most simple-minded of thieves, would dare cut the ratty string with which he attached it to himself. George Bell. Bell was known to many in Germany. He had been implicated in an operation to mint Chevronet, 10 ruble banknotes, and flood the Soviet Union with them, thereby causing inflation. Later, he had apparently bundled the case of uncovering a French spy and divulged military secrets in doing so. Johannes knew he, Bell, had then renewed an earlier relationship with Ernst Ron of the SA and had joined the NSDAP. However, in 1931, a conspiracy by members of the NSDAP to eliminate elements of Rom's circle had broken Bell's relationship with the party, and in 1932, he resigned from the party. Bell had quickly gone from the key supporter of the NSDAP to a principal enemy. He formed a relationship with the Munich journalist Fritz Gerlich, editor and publisher-in-chief of the Degrader Weg. Bell, it had become known to journalists, and especially those associated with the enemies of Hitler, was now emphatically supplying Fritz Gerlich and journalists with inside information. Information on the National Socialist leadership, its activities, and most importantly, its plans. Right in front of my flat. Why? Johannes had replied to Bell's strange inquiry over his car. Well, jump in and drive. Drive down to the Reichstag. It'll be burning in a few minutes, came the rough reply, before the receiver went quiet. The time was 8.50pm. The date, the 27th of February, 1933. 23 minutes later, Johannes was standing atop the Adlon Hotel, looking toward the Reichstag. As on Lindenstrasse, the main firehouse received the first call that the Reichstag was to be found in flames. Join Arctung History again in the next episode as we dive into the events of the 27th of February and the fallout of the fire before looking into the burning of the Reichstag from the National Socialist perspective and how the event that was the final push that toppled German democracy was treated in the 12 years in which they, the NSDAP, ruled. Thank you for listening to the Arctung History Podcast, written and presented by myself, Simon J. James. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please don't forget to leave a review. If you wish to support Arctung History, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Arctung History and become a member. Remember, Every penny raised through Patreon is reinvested into the podcast. For further information, please follow Arctung History on Twitter and Instagram at Arctung History. Until next week, goodbye.